How does it work? Wow, I'm up there. I can't believe it. What does it do? What makes it really tick? Follow me, Rick Ross, on my journey on how it all makes sense. I went to the Benjamin Franklin Institute and found out some interesting facts. And I met a very interesting guy who was crazy about science. Hey, this is Rick Ross, and I'm here with um, Derek Pittitz, the um, president of the astronomy department in the Benjamin Franklin Institute. And wow, it's a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure's all mine. Yeah, so um, tell me about this, this apparatus. What are they called? Wow, this, is this actually the biggest telescope in uh, Philadelphia? Well, sort of. It's the biggest telescope in the Delaware Valley that's available to the general public to look through. It's a Zeiss refracting telescope that was built in the early 1930s specifically for use right here at this location. So it's perfect for people to come look through just so they can get an idea of what objects look like through a telescope. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's so, pretty cool. So um, t tell me, um, Tell me, how does it work? I mean, I mean, it's actually, it's actually pretty basic. Many people think that it's a complex instrument, and the fact of the matter is that it isn't really complex. It's just that it's very big. I mean, if you get into the nitty-gritty details of it, yeah, there's a lot of little specifics about it. But basically, what you have is there's a lens up at the front of the tube that gathers the light. It brings it all the way back here to the eyepiece on this end, mm -hmm. and we look through the eyepiece. Oh, so you actually got to go up those little stairs you go up right the there. To the eyepiece right there, and the cool thing is that the tube right here, all this tube, mm -hmm. there's nothing in that tube. Oh man! Yeah, there's an eyepiece down here on this end, and then up at the front end where the wide black band is. That's where the lens is. Oh. So the lens gathers the light, focuses the light all the way down here. Now the rest of the stuff you see here is just to hold the optics up and to make sure that the optics follow an object along through the sky during the course of the day. Oh. So it's actually pretty simple. It's built just the same as refracting telescopes have been built for hundreds of years. Mm. And um, it's a perfect size for use right here where we are in Center City, Philadelphia. What I suspect is that many people have no idea this telescope is here. <laughs> and if they do know it's here, they don't know that they can come here almost any day and look through it to see the sun. And once a month, they can come down and use it to look at planets and stars and whatever else is available to be seen. Wow. Uh, and, I, and I heard that you can actually see, like, Jupiter and different planets just by looking during, during the, the day, even? The cool thing is that this telescope will absolutely blow your mind about what you can see. So, for example, we can look at the sun during the day. We see sunspots and we may see solar flares and prominences. We might see the moon during the day or maybe Venus during the day. Not so common for that. But then at night, we can see Jupiter, which looks great. We can see Saturn, which is completely unbelievable to most people for how it looks through the telescope. And of course, the moon is always a knockout because oh, yeah. we get so close to it and we can see all the features down on the surface really well. And so people love the view. Oh, and I have one other question. I, I got to ask this, and I know everybody's wondering too. Can you actually like see like um, maybe the, the moon rover? Or yeah, this is a really great question. Sometimes I'll say to people, you know, we can see all kinds of great stuff on the moon. We can even see the rover, the landers on the moon. Not. <laughs> the stuff is too small, it's too far away, and the resolution of the telescope is not good enough. And it's not that the telescope isn't good enough, it's just the way optical stuff works. You know, the farther away something is, the tinier something is, you have to do a lot of magnification, and that you know, often results in a poor image because optical quality can never be perfect, things like that. Oh, and, and, and I also heard like um, uh, atmosphere can get in the way too causing it to blurry out. But don't they have um, some things that can like kind of um, uh, fix, fix it, you know, clear it up a little bit? Yeah, there are actually two things about that. The first thing is that, you're right, uh, the atmosphere does cause a problem for telescopes here on the ground. And so what you do is you do one of three things. You move 
move the telescope up to a place on the surface of the planet where you have less atmosphere. So this is why you find observatories on mountain tops. Less atmosphere for the light rays to get through, right? Okay, so now the next thing that you can do is you can put the telescope in space outside of the atmosphere, what we call space telescope. You can do that. The third thing that has recently been discovered is a way in which you can actually model the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere using a laser to see what the turbulence is like. And then, because telescopes now use digital photography more than anything else, you can take that model of the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, turn it into what's called an algorithm, a mathematical equation, that shows you what the turbulence is, and then you can apply that to the digital imagery taken by the telescope and eliminate the atmosphere. And it's like having a space telescope without having to be in space. Wow. Yeah, that's really very, very cool. It's like magic. It's like magic. And what it does is it lets you build really big, huge telescopes without having to put them in space. Mm. Yeah, because uh, I know that they have well, one place over in, uh, I think, in South America where it's it's the, like the best place where you can actually see because of the there's less atmosphere and it's like high altitude and everything. Uh, I forgot what that place is. The yeah, is Cerro Tololo is one place in South America. Cerro Tololo, out in the uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, in the Azores Islands, just off the coast of North Africa, is another great place. And then the other great place is Hawaii, here uh, oh. out in the Pacific Ocean on. Uh, the big island of Hawaii, Mauna Kea Observatory, is like the number one place in the world to do telescopic observing. Really? Yeah, it's fantastic. Oh. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, and, and one last other thing. I, yeah. I know this um uh, I know this a little technology right here. I mean it's, it's I know this thing's been built in yeah. you know uh, eighteen That's right. <laughs> nineteen oh three, but, right. but there, there's, there's this uh, computer here. Is this what you use to actually um <laughs> it's, it's a it's a trick. Oh, okay. <laughs> So the reason why the computer is here is because when I renovated the observatory about 10 years ago, not 10 years ago, about six years ago, one of the things I did was I added the capability of using a computer to help drive the telescope from one object to another object, make it in a sense what's called a robotic telescope. Now what that means is I bring up a screen on the computer, it's a view of the night sky or a map of the night sky. I can click on an object and the telescope will automatically move to that object. That's fun and everything, I mean it's kind of cool, but really I use it because sometimes there are things that are hard to see in the sky here in Center City with the naked eye that the telescope could see if I could just get to it. Oh. So I get the computer to go to it, then I can see it. Oh, maybe like the International Space Station? Ah. Yeah. <laughs> that would be cool, that would be cool. But here's a really interesting fact about that. You don't even need a telescope to see International Space Station. Oh. It's visible to the naked eye without any problem at all. And the way I say it is that Space Station flies over Philadelphia between four and seven times every day. Wow. So at least four times, but no more than seven times, it flies over Philadelphia every day. Now the question is, is it happening at a time when you can see it? <laughs> you can see it best in the morning before sunrise. There's about an hour and a half or two hour window before sunrise. And then an hour and a half or two hour window in the evening after sunset when you can see it. Oh, Otherwise, okay. during the day, the sky is too bright. Oh right. man, I don't see it right now. And okay. then in the evening, if you wait way late at night, it's too dark and it's in the shadow of the earth. So you have to catch it in the morning just before sunrise or in the evening just after sunset. And then it's then you can see it naked eye. Now, one of the things I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try and use a computer mm -hmm. connected to a telescope okay. to get the telescope to track the space station as it goes across the sky, put a video camera on that, and record the whole thing. Mm. Oh man, that's, that sounds real cool. And that way, um, all y'all guys can see it too. So let's see if we can make this happen. Wow. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, my I'm, pleasure. Right man, time. For a second there, I thought I was talking with Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I, I, <laughs> I think you're giving me like a, a little, like, like a, what is it, a, a, a preemptive. Uh, so uh, so yeah. let me say one thing about that. Yeah. The, often, people compare me to Neil deGrasse Tyson. People always ask if I know Neil. 
and they compare me to Neil deGrasse Tyson, <laughs> and they ask me questions like, don't you wish you could be like Neil? And you know what? The truth of the matter is, you. the thing I appreciate is that in the United States today, the two major astronomers used to help this country understand physics and astronomy, the two main are both African American. Mm. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson and me. <laughs> and I think this is a remarkable thing because astronomy has always been the sort of like reserved study of the highest levels of physics and it's always been other people doing it without much recognition mm. of the African American contribution. Wow, that's... And now, here today, we come to a point where the two people you see most often across the world associated with astronomy and space science are two African Americans. Wow. I think that's a great thing. Oh man, I, I, you know what? I think what it is is I think the brothers is going to work it out. <laughs> That would be great. <laughs> well, okay, people. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, uh, check out some other things. And um, stay tuned because we're not done yet. The brothers are still working it out. And we're going to come up with some more questions and figure out how all this stuff makes sense. So hang in there. Thanks. So, here's the way it worked. The way it works is that Einstein suggested that there was a possibility of a new state of matter, right? Mm -hmm. You get it super, 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 super matter cold. Mm -hmm. But he never tried to actually make it, all right? Yeah. What happened was a guy in India named Satyendra Bose, an Indian guy, oh. figured out how to do it and proved mathematically that it really would work. Okay? Wow. So when he proved it, what next happened is somebody had to try to create the conditions where the temperature would be low enough that this thing would actually happen. Well, nobody could do it until this guy came along. His name is Kleppner. And Dr. Kleppner created the environment, the conditions where you can get things down to one. Let me see if I can get it straight. Within one nine billionth, I think it is, one billionth of a degree of absolute, absolute zero. zero. Okay? Wow. Now, at that temperature, what would happen is you could take hydrogen, you can go from gas to liquid to solid, but when you get down to that temperature, it turns into a different material altogether that has very different properties from anything else that's ever been known. Wow. So he proved it and created the conditions for it and created this stuff called Bose-Einstein condensate, the wow. material that shows up when you get down to that temperature. Nobody had ever done that before. Wow. So this is quantum mechanics, very, very low level, low temperature, totally different kind of environment going on, and that's what he did. Now, the guys that were his students got a Nobel Prize for that. We're going to give him the Franklin Medal, but I know that going forward, he probably will get a Nobel Prize for that. Oh man, that's amazing. That's so. yes. Yeah, and so you're going to be, you're going to, you, you got to go and talk to him like in a few minutes. In a few minutes. So, oh. just, so what I have to do is I have to try to translate what he's done into something totally practical as a hands-on experiment that people can work with, visitors to the museum can work with, so that they can have an idea of what this thing is all about. Wow, and he had to go all the way to Philadelphia. Well, Philadelphia is still relevant with science today. I mean, seriously, oh, we, we, got, we got Derek right here. Check it. <laughs> yeah, check it out. Here's the, thing. here's the thing that people don't realize about Philadelphia. Everybody thinks of Philadelphia as a sports city, right? Got the Eagles, got the Phillies, we got the hockey team, we got everybody, right? Maybe they're not doing all that great, but still we got them, right? And everybody <laughs> thinks we're everybody thinks we're a sports city. I am here to tell you that Philadelphia really is a science city. We are way more about science than we are about sports. Why? Because we have almost every science covered in space, three, four, five, six levels deep.
with some of the best people in the country. And there is stuff going on here in Philadelphia about science that you don't even know about that is way beyond anything anybody else is doing. Wow. And we don't know this because we just pay attention to the sports and don't look at any of the other stuff. <laughs> so, well, you're definitely right about that. I mean, I mean, I just started getting into science myself and I was like, this, uh, this stuff isn't that hard, really, if you start start learning about it. And once you start learning about it, you're like, wow, that's kind of interesting. And then you, you, you start to realize how it all makes sense. And, and that's what this whole show is about, is trying to figure out what makes sense and, and how it makes sense. So you can understand, you might use it in your life one day. You might need science to actually save your life. So it's really important. I, I really think that what you're doing here is like so important that the people today is, they really can't, they're really not clued in on how important it is. And the most important thing about trying to make that happen is to get kids not only interested in science, but to realize that science is a part of their everyday life. Every day, everything they do has some connection to science. And although kids may not know it, they're actually really interested in science. But nobody has brought them along and said, here, check this out, you're gonna love this, and just let them do it. Everybody says, well, there's gonna be a test, and you have to learn all this stuff, and nobody really connects it to anything that's gonna be really important to them in their lives. But if you connect it to something that they can grab hold of, they wanna do it. And then, of course, my thing is tell them, of course you can do it, of course you can do it. There's no reason why you can't do it. So, let's do it, and then I'll let them do it. Wow. Yeah, that's the idea. Get them home for life. Because once they get excited about it, they'll never let it go. You look at me, here I am. I never let it go. Oh man, you're learning every day. Like, I mean. <laughs> every day. The, the fun thing about science is that, always, especially astronomy, there's always something new. There's always something exciting. There's always something crazy going on. And it's always the most amazing thing you can imagine. Always, always, always. Wow. Thanks a lot. Well, I'm not going to let you be late for the meeting. And, um, oh, goodness. I'm going to hey. just drop all my stuff here. But we got, we, Thanks I really a lot. appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it, Rick. Man, and, and, and I can't believe it. It's like, wow, look at this. We got, we got, we, we, we don't just got Neil deGrasse Tyson. We got, we got Derek Pitts. Derek Pitts right here. This is Derek Pitts right here. This guy is like one of the leading scientists in the world. I'm just doing my thing because it's fun. I'm just having fun. That's oh, all man. it is. I'm just having fun. Well, keep having fun today. All right, Rick. Good I'm going to try to get man. more people in this. I mean, this is really interesting. It is. It is. I, I hate to shut the camera off right now, but I got to. All right, people, hang in there, and we're going to find out how all this stuff makes sense.